Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. Quick note about the foundation, we're on the way to doing our massive literature review of peer-reviewed papers and lectures and interviews of people and um, 5,000 plus sources of why and how people that suffer from depression and anxiety can be helped. And the goal is to make a low or no cost resource for people that are suffering. So to find out more, go to FindingGeniusFoundation.org. And today, my guest is Sandura Imani. Uh, he's a professor, Department of Translational Molecular Pathology, uh, part of the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. And we're going to talk about uh, cancer metastasis. So, Imani, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, for hosting me. And a uh, special thanks to you for... Uh inviting scientists like me and then um, interviewing us and then uh, getting our perspective for your audience. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. So tell me about um, your research, a little bit about your career path. How did you get to where you're at? So I I completed my uh, PhD from a place called Indian Institute of Science, which is one of the premier institute in India. Then um, I came to MIT in Boston and I did my postdoctoral work with um, Professor Robert Weinberg. Uh, from there, I moved to Houston to MD Anderson. Then I have been here for the last or four, close to 14 years. And I'm a professor now, a tenured professor at the MD Anderson Cancer Center. Well, very good. And within cancer, are you focused on metastases or what's your focus there? So I am primarily interested in, uh, in my lab. Uh, I would say we are interested in understanding the biology of cancer metastasis. So we use breast tissue or breast cancer as a, a primary kind of tumor model to study. But what we study is applicable to most of the carcinomas, which are tumors of an epithelial tissue. Your current research or your current work, what is it focused on specifically? So a while ago, um, I can just give you a little background about, uh, you know, why we study what we study. So most of the cancer patients, if they are diagnosed uh, early, you know, with the current uh, advancement in diagnosis and availability of various treatments, including targeted therapy, um, the survival rate is pretty high in most of the uh, cancers, except uh, pancreatic, uh, pancreatic cancer and liver cancer. So, however, independent of the cancer type, if a patient is presented with a metastasis, then the survival rate is extremely low. And that's where I got interested to understand the biology because the biology of this cancer metastasis in general is not well studied. And the number of groups are investigating all around the globe. So that's what I am interested in to see how we can shed some light on understanding the biology. Through that, we can develop therapeutics. So just to give you kind of um, in a nutshell, 
that when an, if you think about an epithelial tissue, uh, they are all attached with one another through something called cell cell adhesion molecules. What they do is they they glue them together so that, for example, if you think about a breast duct where the milk is produced, the milk always goes into the lumen, not to the other side. This is because the, this something called cell cell adhesion molecules they hold the cells together so that the protein can be or the milk can be secreted into the lumen, but not to the backside. Now, such a cell, when it gets transformed to become a cancerous, they remain bound to one another, but they don't have this polarity of called apical basal polarity. They don't have that any longer, but they are stuck with one another because of this continued expression of these cell cell adhesion molecules. So what we found when I was a postdoc uh, with uh, uh, some of my colleagues that the cells need to break the cell cell adhesion in order for them to go from where they are to any other parts of the body. For example, a breast cancer metastasizing to the lung, they need to break the cell cell adhesion within the breast tissue. And this process is called epithelial to mesenchymal transition. The reason why it's called epithelial to mesenchymal transition, because the epithelial tumor cells, they take on mesenchymal properties uh, to complete this migration and re-establishment of metastasis at the distant site. So do they go on uh, mesenchymal back to epithelial transition when they arrive? Correct, correct. I was going to go there. So so during embryo, de- thank you. Uh, during embryo development, there's a following fertilization, there's a type of cells called epiblast. They are epithelial in nature. They undergo this EMT transition during embryo development. Through that, they generate mesoderm. And the mesoderm kind of move around and uh, create various mesenchymal organ. In addition, the mesoderm also differentiates into epithelial tissue through mesenchymal to epithelial uh, uh, differentiation and generates, for example, kidney and ovary during embryo development. What cancer does, it copies that methodology which it used at some point and uh, makes this mesenchymal looking cells migrate to a newer site and then differentiate back to epithelial cell and create a metastasis. Does this happen only in embryos and only in cancer or does it happen in adults or you know in children? It primarily happens in embryo but in a cancer it get activated and also during fibrosis um, organ fibrosis, I'm sure, you know, there are a number of tissue fibrosis, which happens, kidney fibrosis, liver fibrosis, even during that time, it happens. It also happens during wound healing, right? When you think about a wound, um, the tissue and the wound site undergoes this EMT transition, and then covers the wound. And during the, pro- once they undergo EMT, they create, uh, fill the wound, and they differentiate back to epithelial that, again, it happens during wound healing as well. But in wound healing, is it do fibroblasts migrate to the site and then just go through the transition in one direction only? They don't. There's yeah. no rearrangement, right? There's no like EMT so, and then TME. It does happen EMT and MET. So in a wound healing and the wound site, the neighboring epithelial cells undergo EMT, um, create mesenchymal looking cells, and they fill the wound. And as they fill the wound, they re-differentiate back to epithelial state. So then they close the wound. Uh, um, and then they re-establish the cell cell adhesion molecules. And then they close the wound. So it does happen uh, EMT and the MET uh, at the wound site. Is there any um, subset of the whole EMT transition that's used by cells to migrate throughout the body to go through tissues? Like, you know, if I want to pass through uh, the blood-brain barrier or through the wall of a cell, do you see like parts of this process being utilized by cells to move around the body? Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit findinggeniuspodcast.com and click on support us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. 
Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click support us today. Now back to the show. Very good question. So one other thing which um, uh, which I discovered again was that if you think about a metastasis, right? Let's say a pathologist is looking at a metastasis in a lung tissue um, or he, he or she, a doctor, uh, a pathologist looking at a, a finding a tumor in a lung tissue. Now, uh, a pathologist could right away identify whether that particular tumor found in the lung, is it coming from breast or prostate or spleen or liver, just by looking at a, the histopathology of the tumor. In other words, a tumor leaving, let's say, breast tissue through this EMT program carries the information as to where they are coming from into the site where they are going to land. Now, we know this EMT and the MET play a role in metastasis. And, uh, and they not only become undergo this EMT, MET, but also recreate a structure histopathologically similar to where they come from. Therefore, I hypothesized that during this EMT transition, these cells not only become mesenchymal, but also become a stem cells. And that turned out to be true. And that's a paper which has got a, you know, more than 8,500 citation. Very few paper has such kind of citation. Um, uh, the reason it has such a high citation is it's not only proven in breast cancer, it's also proven in all type of cancer. That such a phenomenon kind of promotes um, epithelial carcinoma cells uh, to acquire stem cell properties. Now, what is an implication of this finding? What it says is that now, when the tumor cell leave the primary site into the blood, they walk around in the blood as a stem cell rather than just a tumor cell. Therefore, they are able to escape the immune system. They are able to overcome the various other environmental stress, and they are able to reestablish a tumor at the distant site. And so that kind of answers your question. Being a stem cells, they are able to overcome number of hurdles they encounter uh, in their transit from primary tumor to the metastatic site. Um, what do you think the uh, cellular signaling is based on? Is it like extracellular vesicles that the signaling is uh, is happening to cause this transition? Or what do you think it is? Thank you. So the signaling, so there are two ways this can happen. One, it could be cell intrinsic versus cell extrinsic. So when it comes to cellular cell intrinsic, the, you know, when a cell can, for example, a gene called e uh, which is one of the primary glue pro, uh, protein which holds cells together, they can undergo a process called methylation in their gene promoter through epigenetic regulation. You can, this is cell intrinsic, tumor cell intrinsic. Through that, they can lose some of this epithelial nature and gain some mesenchymal nature, and then they can travel. The second most prominent our most possible uh, method is inflammation. So most of these tumor tissue tend to have more inflammation. So when that happens, you have a various cell types um, migrating into the tumor microenvironment to kind of fix the wound, you know, because tumor is considered to be a wound, to fix the wound or to, uh, in other words, to heal the wound or, um, or even to kill the tumor cells. So there's quite a lot of inflammation happens. During that process, the number of inflammatory cytokines or growth factors are produced within the tumor microenvironment. And many of them has the capacity to induce this epithelial to mesenchymal transition and stem cell properties. While the process is spontaneous and natural, it's supposed to protect human being by killing the tumor cells, but the same process kind of facilitates this metastasis by inducing stemness, uh, stem cell properties to the cancer cells. So that's the tumor cell extrinsic factors for inducing uh, EMTM stemness. What, what do you think happens when the metastasis first starts versus when it takes hold, like the first cells that arrive, how do they take up residence? If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Good point. So there are there are a number of models which are out there suggesting that, you know, there's something called a seed and soil hypothesis proposed by, you know, this is uh, Paget, and it's kind of the, the hypothesis goes that a tumor cell being a seed and the tumor microenvironment at the distant side being a soil and how these two 
could interact and that interplay could modulate the metastatic behavior uh, in Stephen Paget. So, so this during this process, now there are different type of tumor cells. Some would have undergone maybe, let's say, 5% EMT, and some would have undergone a 50% EMT, and some would have undergone 100% EMT. So the cells which has undergone either zero or no EMT, when they land in a distant site, for some reason, they cannot survive, they tend to die. Same way, the cells undergone a complete EMT also are a, capable of landing at a distant site, but they remain just to stay there. They don't go further. But on the other hand, the cells which gained mesenchymal property while retaining an epithelial property, when they land in a distant site, they tend to do well. Now, when it comes to the microenvironment at the distant site, anytime, as you know, a tumor cell land in a, let's say, lung tissue, the lung tumor, micro, uh, lung microenvironment right away, try to stop the tumor cells from proliferating. But the tumor cells are equipped to overcome that hurdle and they continue to proliferate. Um, so there are a number of studies recently showing that um, uh, various immune cells, uh, in fact, uh, migrate immediately to the site where the tumor cell uh, is homing to, and then they try to stop, but sometimes the tumor cell overtakes that. But what do you think the first cell or cells that start a metastasis, what do you think they're undergoing and how is their interaction different once they arrive at a site? versus, you know, subsequent ones that come through. Thank you. So, so the question is, like, and you were asking if a cell, um, the, the first cell or the cell which seeds a metastasis, how, what kind of thing, what kind of hurdle that tumor cell would uh, encounter or how does it est- uh, survive and establish versus the subsequent cells, which are daughter cells of that first seeded cell. So when a cell undergoes this EMT and be- become mesenchymal and stem-like, they are able to go either as a single cell or as a cluster of cells in the blood. Sometimes there's also studies which shows that tumor cells get coated by platelets and then this emboli, they migrate to a different site and then they undergo something called extravasation where they come out from the blood vessel into the, uh, into the tissue. And that's your first cell and then they need to find a way to establish, first, they need to survive. That's a major hurdle for the cancer cell to kind of survive because it's a different kind of growth factor microenvironment. But the tumor cells would have undergone a number of mutation by then. So that allows them to not to get killed or not to undergo something called apoptosis, which, which is a process by which a cell, when they uh, become uh, bad, they commit suicide. That suicidal program is also uh, turned off. So such a cell kind of survive. Uh, we call that as a dormancy. There are, in some patients, these tumor cells can last, for example, 10 years, 15 years. Uh, in breast cancer, for example, ER positive breast cancer patients, they can have a tumor sitting in their bone marrow for tens and fifteens of years doing nothing. But at some point, the tumor microenvironment, either aging, or, uh, or some kind of an inflammation that allows that uh, the seeded cell to come out of dormancy. They start proliferating and differentiating and gives rise to daughter cells. Those cells, now they have an advantage because the mother cell or the, the seeded cell created a, a perfect microenvironment for them to survive. Now, these metastases can go on to develop a secondary metastasis Let's say a tumor developed a, a, a metastasis in the lung, and that can seed addition, additional metastasis to various organs. Now, again, the first cell undergoes or experiences a lot of stress when they land at the uh, distant organ, but the subsequent cells eventually comes out, the daughter cells, they will have less hurdle, but the daughter cells, not all of them would be a stem cell. Um, that could be predominantly differentiated uh, cancer cells, but there will be some cancer stem cells generated even at the distant metastatic site through secondary EMT process. What are the, um, I don't know if this can be cultured but or histologically looked at, but what are the adjacent cells at a metastatic site, the adjacent healthy cells? Like let's say there's a metastasis in the liver of uh, pancreatic cancer. What is the interface between the pancreatic cells that have migrated 
versus the remaining liver cells that are adjacent to it look so it's uh, it's basically um you know you know you are it's it's most of the time um when when an a pathologist detect metastasis they are all not micrometastasis they tend to be uh, larger you tend to see single cells most of the time in the bone marrow uh, because it's easier to identify a tumor cell from um, the, the the micro environment because in a bone marrow every cell uh, none of the cells express something called a protein called a cytokeratin but tumor cells express cytokeratin so as a result in a bone marrow if you just stain for a cytokeratin even if there are single cell you can detect them and you can study how they are different or how they are similar but in a liver they all express same type of protein it's very difficult to distinguish a tumor cell from a normal cell if they are a single cells but experimentally we can study that we can inject tumor cells and then allow them to home to the liver and then you know you can see the number of cells in a fewer number and you can make them look like a single cells and then you can ask now these labeled tumor cells and how are they playing how are they sitting next to the liver cells now one thing happens is that when these tumor cells land in liver first thing happens is that the immune cells go fast into that micro environment and they kind of cover, try to fight so that's what happens during colonization of such as in this case let's say liver which you asked why do you think that um, cancers have tropisms you know like pancreatic cancer seems to have preferential sites that spreads to liver has its own lung has its own why do you think there appears to be tropisms for certain tissues and not others so again there are two hypotheses one is um, the uh, seed and soil hypothesis that some tumor cells prefer some tumor micro environment the second one is the kind of drainage now the the veins and arteries which kind of drains blood from one organ to another that kind of facilitates metastasis much more for example when you want to study uh, metastasis uh, uh, in the lung we introduce the tumor cells through the tail vein of the mice and they just right away this land in um, in the lungs and uh, for uh, for a bone people introduce tumor cells through intracardiac route then that directly goes and get seeded in the in the bone so in other words in your in case of pancreatic cancer Uh, developing metastasis in the liver is most of the time that's uh, uh, the organ where the pancreatic uh, arteries or veins they uh, drain into that's one and then top of that and uh, the liver is one of the most growth factor rich en- environment where it's you have more um, circulation and uh, it's easy for tumor cells to uh, grow and uh, develop metastasis so that's why pancreatic cancer tend to develop metastasis in the liver any other organ do you think there's a communication between primary and metastases or amongst metastases like it's a distributed brain you know like the 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 cancer being a, a, an organism that again communicates with its its outposts it's a very good question again there is a number of studies people have done asking like a primary tumor can it block metastasis so there was a hypothesis that uh, a primary tumor blocks metastasis the minute you remove the primary tumor that inhibitory signal given by the primary tumor is taken out then as a result the tumor cells seeded at the distant site they don't have a break anymore and they tend to develop metastasis so that's you know there is a number of uh, hypothesis experiments done uh, along the line for sure um, the tumor primary tumor does communicate to the uh, metastasis there was a, a postdoc in um, in Bob Weinberg lab now she's a faculty at Harvard she was studying how uh, one tumor and one side of the let's say mouse breast can influence uh, tumor cells on the other side and uh, so the tumor tend to definitely communicate from one side or one part of the body to the other uh, either through growth factor secreted um or through some kind of an immune cells which are programmed in one side and those programmed immune cells can go and influence other for example we study something called the myeloid derived suppressor cells the m2 macrophage there are many other immune cells they are immune promoting or tumor promoting and immune suppressive so if one side of the tumor let's say they produce many of that now they those cells can go and influence the tumor which are present in a distant site positively 
So, and I also, it's also probably true, uh, vice versa. So, yes, you are absolutely right. A tumor from one side can influence tumor in another side. So what are some of the big, big questions that you're trying to answer still about metastases? Like where in particular are you, what, what questions are you trying to answer right now? So again, the goal, ultimate goal is to find a way to target metastasis so that we can, you know, even if a patient walks into the clinic with the metastasis, if we can target them, if you can treat them, that's my ultimate goal. The, my, my interest and my lab's interest. And that, with that, we are working hard towards that. But then, as you said, for that, we need to understand the biology. So the way we are studying right now, one other thing we are asking, we know this EMT program play a role. And we also know that the cells need not undergo this complete mesenchymal transition. Rather, they just need to gain mesenchymal and stem cell properties without losing epithelial properties. And they are more fit to develop metastasis. In fact, you interviewed a person with the name Herbie Levin, who is my collaborator from North, uh, Northeastern. We are studying how this gaining mesenchymal without losing epithelial uh, promotes uh, metastasis. We call this a hybrid EMT. And uh, so in addition, now, how these cells are interacting with the immune cells, that's one area we are um, uh, investigating. And we are using a lot of single cell RNA sequencing. Uh, We are sequencing um, tumors, uh, primary tumors and metastasis and asking both the tumor cells and immune cells what kind of signaling they do have and how can we uh, intervene uh, those signaling. We are also trying to uh, dive into a spatial transcriptomics where you can ask a tumor cell, the question you asked earlier is that when a tumor cell land at a particular site, what kind of um, signaling which happens between a tumor cell and, and, the, and the microenvironment, that's uh, we can do through only through spatial transcriptomics and we are getting into that. We are also doing something called the multiplex immunofluorescence where you can, you know, originally uh, we were able to just sustain one marker in a tumor and characterize, you know, what's going on. But now we can stain up to 40 different markers in one tumor. um, And then you can characterize various cell types within a tumor, which is called a site off. So we kind of use that technology to, again, understand spatial orientation of tumor cells with an immune cell and uh, immune suppressive uh, immune cells. So so that's the area we are working on with an ultimate goal, again, um, find a way to diagnose and treat patients with metastasis. Okay, well, very good. Well, Mani, what's the best way for people to find out more about your research? Where can they go? So I, you know, they could uh, re- check my lab website, um, which is www.manimoney.us. Uh, that will direct them to the MD Anderson website. Could also find uh, uh, in a Google Scholar, also in my, my Twitter feed, um, which is uh, Sendure Money. And uh, yeah, of course, uh, my MD Anderson email, which is listed on the, my lab website. Well, very good. Well, Mani, thank you for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. And the work you're doing is critically important, you know, because so many people die of cancer, especially when it metastasizes. So thank you for what you do. Well, I really appreciate you making time to interview scientists like me and then bringing this awareness to many people. It's really, I really appreciate for what you are doing. Thank you very much. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.